So um, for those just now joining up the recording, uh, thank you. This is the uh, September 2021 meeting of the Astronomy Fundamentals Special Interest Group. Uh, tonight, we have two presentations uh, getting close to finish, continuing our march towards completing all the constellations. Uh, David Evans will be presenting the, con the Southern Constellation Hydra. Hydras. Hydras, excuse me, thank you. Um, not to be confused with the Northern Constellation Hydra, which I just did, uh, <laughs> slip of the tongue. And uh, after that, uh, I will be doing presenting our main topic on the astronomer William Herschel. Uh, so that was actually a really interesting presentation to, for me to put together. Uh, so I hope you'll enjoy that. And uh, with that, David, I need to make you a co-host so that you can actually present. All right. You gave me a great segue. You'll you'll see that on my second slide. <laughs> I'll so share. You should now have permissions to screen share. Go ahead and give it a shot. All right. Um, and while you're doing that, may I forgot to send out my my bond report. Uh, this month, I apologize. I'll have to slip that in next month. I it slipped my mind completely, and I didn't see any email notification, so I apologize. Okay, we'll look forward to getting it next month. Thank you. Actually, I'll probably just send out this month's and that and last month's um, right after th this meeting on the weekend. So I okay, can focus, super. So I can focus on class instead of waiting. Super. All right, can everybody see my slide? Yeah, yes. All right, so uh, Constellation Hydrus uh, for this month. So Hydrus does not equal Hydra. Um, thanks for the segue, Connor. Um, Hydrus uh, is the male water snake and uh, Hydra is the female water snake. And uh, there's quite a contrast between the two. Hydra is the largest of the 88 constellations measuring 1,303 square degrees. And being a snake, it's the longest of all the constellations at over 100 degrees in length. Hydrus, on the other hand, often known as the lesser snake, is the 61st largest constellation in spanning 243 square degrees. Hydra, uh, straddles the celestial equator and was first described in the second century by Ptolemy. Hydrus was too far south to be observed by the ancient Greeks and was first described by Planicus um, in 1597. As you recall, Planicus um, described 12 constellations uh, in, in the far south. So Hydrus, the diagram uh, shows three stars, uh, has a regular shape, and it's bordered by uh, Mensa to the southeast, Verdanus to the east, Horogalium and Rutilium to the northeast, Phoenix to the north, Tacana to the west, uh, west northwest, Noctans to the south. It has a declination of 57, of minus 5785 to minus 82. So it's not visible from locations north of plus 30. The French astronomer, Nicolas Louis de Kale, which is on the upper right, uh, modified Hydrus from Planicus's original drawing while de Kale was observing from the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa in 1756. He actually made the Hydra, Hydrus a little bit smaller in his map of the region. Uh, it also uh, I, from past pre topics, I believe it's pronounced Lakai and the Lakai. L's are silent. Great, thank you, appreciate Typic that. Typical French with all of their silent characters like Messier and their yeah. silent R's and silent L's. And, and you know, I flunked French in, in high school, so. I've had four years of French between high school and college, so it's <laughs> one of those you just never forget. Um, it also got a little bit of notoriety because in Moby Dick, Urban Melville mentions both Hydrus and Ardonavus, uh, highlighting his knowledge of the constellations in the southern whaling regions. So, 
Hydrus again was established by Planicus and it had originally 15 stars. Uh, Connor, how do we say Lakaia? Lakai. Lakai, I'm sorry. Modified the constellation to include 20 stars in 1756, but he actually made it smaller. Um, five of the stars in the Hydrus constellation have identified exoplanets. However, it has no Messier objects and only faint deep sky objects. But it is very near to the large Maginellic cloud in Dorado, which on this map is on the left side, and the small Maginellic cloud in Tucana, which is the uh, green circle on the right. And the small um, cloud actually um, gets into the uh, region of uh, Hydrus, and we'll talk about that later. So again, um, usually the alpha star is the brightest, but in this case, it's the beta. Um, it's the closest bright star to the South Pole, and beta Hydrae is, uh, shines at magnitude 2.8, and it's 24 light years from Earth. It has a mass of 104% of the sun, in a radius of 181% of the sun. It's three times more luminous and has a spectral classification of G24, a subgiant star. This classification indicates that it's exhausting its hydrogen fuel at its core, giving us a glimpse of our sun's future state. And there's one possible Jupiter-sized exoplanet out there, but uh, as of the last report that I saw, it's not confirmed. But that report was several years ago, so it may have been confirmed since. Alpha Hydrae um, is at the top of the triangle. It's a white subgiant star of mag 2.9, and it's located 72 light years more from Earth. It's easily found that bright or that large black dot just north is Achenar, which is the ninth brightest star in the sky and it's located in the constellation of Rodanus. Alpha Hydrae is a F04, and it's in the very late stages of burning hydrogen in its core. It's two times as massive as the sun, and it's 3.3 times its radius, and it shines with a luminosity of 26 times of our sun. But it's interesting, um, it's almost done burning hydrogen, but yet it's a very young star at 810 million years old. So burn bright and die fast. Gamma hydrite forms the left lower triangle. It's the third brightest star in Hydrus and it shines at magnitude 3.24. It's 214 light years from Earth. Its spectral class is M23. It's a red giant uh, star. It is 60 times the sun's solar radius and 655 times more luminous. It's interesting because Gamma Hydrae is a semi variable pulsating star, which var varies between mag 3.26 and 3.33. However, they haven't established its period as of yet, so the star warrants more study. The next star is actually very, very close to uh, um, Gamma Hydrae. It's just three degrees northeast. It's not on the map of the star chart that I have here, but uh, the middle of the circle is about where it's at. And it's uh, called VW Hydrae. And it's a dwarf nova of the SU Ursi Majoris type. And variables of this type are composed of a compact binary pair with a solar type secondary star, while the primary star is a white dwarf star. And then there's an accretion disk around the primary component. So the observed outbursts are believed to be the result of interactions within the disk that circles the white dwarf. And this can be sometimes very extreme. Um, you can have your normal dwarf nova outburst, which consists of a rise from normal um, to two to six magnitudes over a one to three day period. 
And then occasionally these stars display bouts of super outbursts, which are even brighter. So this star gets a lot of attention for that particular reason. So let's take a look at some double stars. Um, Phi Hydra um, is a red giant and it's on the left-hand side um, with a, I think a black circle around it. It's 476 uh, light years distance and Phi Hydra 2 is an orange giant at 488 light years. It's not a true um, binary system, but really just an optical double. Eta Hydra, on the other hand, is also a uh, optical double. Uh, the first star is a blue white main sequence star located 700 light years from Earth. And Eta Hydra 2 is a yellow giant located 218 light years from Earth. And they have found an exoplanet around uh, Eta Hydrae 2 um, of uh, 6.5 um, Jupiter's mass. And that's an orbit around Eta Hydrae 2. A couple other stars that have uh, exoplanets. HD 1080 um, is a sun-like star. It has seven and possibly nine exoplanets. 127 light years from Earth and sh shines at a magnitude of 7.33. Um, either at seven or nine exoplanets in one system, it's one of the larger number of uh, systems known in terms of number of exoplanets. So it does get a lot of study for that. The next is GJ3021, another sun-like star 57 light years away. And it has another Jupiter-sized exoplanet orbiting very close at 0.5 AUs, and it has a period of 133 days. There is also a true binary star with GJ3021, which is a companion red dwarf, but that red dwarf is orbits out at uh, 68 AU. So there's a lot of questions about how that orbital system works it appears from what I understood is that the Jupiter-sized exoplanet um, orbits just 3021, while the uh, binary dwarf actually um, orbits them both and is probably independent of any activity going on with the exoplanet. HD 2000... Uh, uh, 2003 or 2003 is a magnitude of 8.7. It's a yellow main sequence star of the type G85. It's a little cooler and smaller than our sun, and it's 143 light years away. It has two planets that are around, and these are rocky planets. Um, they're around 12 and 13 and a half times as massive as the Earth and their periods are 12 and 34 days, respectively. So in, at least in my mind, a, a rocky planet that large, um, especially that close in, um, I, I think we'll hear a lot more about this particular um, system. So that's it for the stars in the system. Most of the other ones are either nondescript or, or not named. Matter of fact, none of the stars in that system are actually uh, named like uh, um, Belgees or um, um, Akinar. So they're all just named by their um, catalogs. So deep sky objects, um, eight, IC1717. Uh, this was originally found by the Danish astronomer John Dreyer in the late 1800s, very near the Eta Hydrae binary system. However, it's no longer there. Um, some speculate that it was a supernova, um, but this is discounted because if it was a supernova, it would have severely affected the Eta Hydrae system. They're very, very close to each other. So it was more commonly believed that it's a faint comet that's moved on. But either way, there's nothing there anymore. Um, I just find it interesting that they still keep the... Uh, um, designation um, when, when nothing's there. The picture on the right is uh, 
the White Rose Galaxy, and this is PGC 6240. It's 345 million light years from Earth. And this is likely the result of two galaxies um, who have collided in the past. The galaxy, when you look at it, um, has many young 400 mil million year old clusters juxtaposed with many of the much older clusters that are a billion years old and more. So really the, the thought is, um, and this is also a uh, elliptical galaxy, that uh, it's really the result of, a, of an ancient collision um, sometime in the past. Another one um, is NGC 1511. And this is a spiral galaxy uh, located just north of Gamma Hydra and south of uh, Beta Reticulum. It's magnitude 11.3 and 62 million light years distance. While it's not visible from Tucson, observers farther south will be able to view it, view it in amateur class telescopes. And I found a lot of literature on this one, in particular, um, a uh, article, and I have a, the source at the end, um, by Corey Belosky and Manthe, who suggest in their paper that NGC 1511 is really two uh, galaxies. Um, it has a companion galaxy of 1511b, um, which is not in this picture, but uh, the galaxy has been uh, severely disturbed. In fact, both have been severely disturbed by the collision. And in their paper, they suggest that the group uh, displays a prime example of interaction uh, induced star formation or star formation is caused by a two, collision between two different objects. And uh, it was a pretty interesting, I frankly understood very little about the paper except for the abstract, uh, but it was, a, it was an interesting read. NGC 602 um, is actually, it's, it's a bright cluster um, on the edge of the small Magellanic cloud and it's embedded in the N90 nebula. And the N90, N90 nebula is essentially the uh, brightly covered colored spots or, or uh, gas around the, the edge of that. Um, NGC 602 is actually three different um, groupings. The first grouping is that large central grouping um, just south of, uh, or just to the south of the center part. Um, the other one is on the far left. And then just uh, the two bright stars really just above the middle of that photo is the third grouping. So these three groupings of NGC 602 have pushed away that less dense gas and form what they call elephant trunks of that uh, nebula. And I think that's a pretty good description of what they look like. And around that, you have very high star formation. And uh, most of the star formation, and this is in the, the Hubble Space Telescope, um, most of that star formation is unseen. Um, you'd have to take the uh, infrared and the Spitzer Space Telescope to really see that star formation. You don't see it in this picture. But there's a lot of it's going on, and it's all being generated uh, by the solar winds, um, compacting the gas around the elevator, around the elephant uh, trunks um, from the three components of NGC 602. And that picture is from the Hubble. Another one in uh, NGC 1466. Uh, we, we leave the small Magellanic cloud and we go to the large one. Um, this is in Hydrus, uh, but is probably more associated with uh, um, Tucana or with uh, Dorado, excuse me. Uh, NGC uh, 1466 is noted for having 49 and possibly 50 RR Lyra stars. Now RR Lyra variables are periodic variable stars and they're often found in globular clusters like NGC 46, 1466. 
And the neat thing about our Lyra star is that they are used for uh, standard candles to measure extragalactic, extragalactic distances. And uh, a, a lot of this work was done by the female astronomers at, uh, at Harvard. And I imagine Doug, you'll cover this quite a bit next week. But I, I read a comment that uh, if we did not understand our, our Lyra variables that uh, the women at Harvard studied, um, our understanding of the galaxy formation in the universe would be dramatically different. So the R Lyra variables are typically metal poor population stars, and they're confined on a very narrow region of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. And it's interesting, their pulsations or what makes them variable is driven by radiation that's partially blocked from escaping the star as the radiation is trying to uh, escape um, and it can't, you get an increase in pressure and temperature, which makes them expand. But while they're expanding, gravity takes over again and contracts them and you get uh, variation based on that. And it turns into a, a very um, regular variation that makes them such great stellar uh, candles. So that's it. Um, not a lot in this, uh, um, in Hydrus, um, a, a very small and, and dim uh, constellation far south. But what there is, is very interesting. So my sources, uh, most of this information came from Wikipedia, but also a constellation guide. And a, and a lot of the interesting, very interesting um, information came out of the AAVSO. Um, along with uh, um, other sources, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the Carnegie Irving um, Galaxy Survey, Telescopius, and then that paper, which I referred to by um, Manthe and Korbolowski, was Neutral Hydrogen Gas and Interacting Galaxies, uh, the NGC 1511 Galaxy Group. So those are the primary sources I've used. Any questions? Uh, no questions? Connor, I guess I'll let it back to you. Thanks, David. Yeah, thank you. Let me get my desktop in order here. Too many PDFs open for school at the same time. Uh, And is anyone able to see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So um, moving right along uh, tonight, uh, we're talking about the astronomer uh, William Herschel, who uh, has a lot of things credited to his name. Uh, and so some of them that were very much ahead of his time. So when my keyboard decides to work and I can hit next slide, Come on, there we go. So uh, William Herschel was born in Hanover, Germany uh, in 1738 to uh, his father Isaac and mother Anna. He was one of 10 children uh, amongst his parents and including his younger sister, Carolyn Herschel, which uh, we will probably learn more about next month. Uh, Herschel, William, his father and his brother Jacob all served as oboist in a in one of the uh, many uh, night groups that were common in uh, Europe at the time in the early 17th and the 1700s. Uh, keeping in mind that at this time, uh, Germany was then known as the Holy Roman Empire with a lot of independent city-states, which all kind of hated each other. Uh, so, uh, at this time, the Hanover duchy, I think it was a duchy, uh, was allied with the English crown. And they, uh, despite being, as I 
a territory of the Holy Roman Empire, highlighting there's a lot of complex political relationships uh, during this particular period in history. The Hanover Guards were uh, sent to England, which is the Hanover excuse me, the Hanover Guards, which was the guard group that the Herschels were, uh, the three Herschels were members of, uh, were ordered to England in 1755 uh, until they were recalled back to England in 1757 to defend the city against a potential war with France. Uh, Hanover being an ally of England, it made the sense to have them as a, a target of any potential conflict. During one such battle, the Hanover Guards were defeated. Uh, this is known as the Battle of Hastenback. And Will's father sent his two sons back to England to seek refuge after the battle. Uh, at this point, uh, it's known that William's brother Jacob had received a discharge from the knight group, uh, but William was never given a formal discharge. So he was actually later accused of desertion. Uh, and it took uh, some of his uh, later works where he became acquainted with King George III, uh, who then pardoned him from this uh, crime just because it was something that was never documented. His, his uh, hello, uh, brain fart. What was it? His discharge. Uh, I don't know why that escaped me. Uh, uh, since the 1700s were commonly referred to as a great boon for classical music, you had a lot of, uh, of really great composers during this time. And so uh, music featured heavily in, uh, in Herschel's early education. Again, he was an oboist inside of a military band. Uh, so he, became, he was acquired proficiency uh, over many of his early years with several instruments, including the violin, harpsichord, and the organ. Uh, primarily playing the latter three as part of uh, normal church services uh, in England after he moved there uh, during after the Battle of Hastenback. He actually has 24 symphonies credited to his name and a lot of other small minor musical pieces, uh, which is kind of impressive that he managed to write that many symphonies, uh, which are usually large, you know, 10, 20 minute pieces of music. Uh, During this time, uh, after his migration to England, he became the head of the uh, Durham Militia Band for uh, a year or so. And uh, he served as the first organist of what is now uh, Halifax Minister Church in England. Uh, eventually, he ended his musical career when he was appointed the director of the Bath Orchestra in 1780, where his sister, where he often used his sister Caroline as part of the soprano role in various operas. Um, before finishing up the tour, before we get into some of his more important astronomy exploits, uh, he was married in 1788 to Mary Pitt in Slough, England, where they were living at the time, and where Her uh, Herschel maintained his observatory. The first and only child between the couple, uh, John Herschel, was born in 1792 when William was at the age of 54. Uh, so kind of pretty late for having, uh, having a child by today's standards. I forgot to include the age of Mary Pitt in this, so I don't actually have that off the top of my head, so I apologize. Uh, he was elected as a foreign honorary member of the American Academy for Arts in 1788. And I put this here because it was kind of, kind of interesting that at this point, America was, you know, as a country was barely going on, you know, three or four years old. I think we had, we had just adopted the, constitu uh, the Constitution in 1788. So it was kind of, it's one of those things where just like, we, he was given this honor to a country that at the time really wasn't significant. Which, which it, it, get, it gets kind of one of those like, huh, that's funny. Um, especially so when considering that at the time John was considered an Englishman. And so you have kind of these, the bitter relationships of the revolution of the American Revolutionary War here, kind of like an odd thing to have happen. Uh, he eventually died in Slough, England on August 25th in 1822. So 
his first exposure to astronomy was through a book called the A Complete System of Optics by uh, it, English mathematician Robert Smith. Uh, Smith was one of several uh, thinkers at the time who was working to promote the works of Isaac Newton. Uh, so this book was a complimentary to that. Uh, he, he came across Smith because Smith also published a book on uh, acoustics. Uh, so he was actually driven into astronomy through the channel of, of music, which at the time was also very related to mathematics. So he you know, jumped straight from music all the way into astronomy. Uh, as part of reading the book, he acquired an interest in building his own telescopes. Uh, and over the course of several years, he uh, would grind the primary mirrors uh, for his own reflector telescopes, uh, sometimes spending as much as 16 hours a day. And eventually his sister, Caroline, when she moved over to England from Hanover, would uh, become one of the, her, become very important in his, his role, in the role of, uh, in the construction of many of the telescopes that Herschel used. Uh, this is uh, an example of a, the, one of the mirror polishers that he used. This is currently on display in the William Herschel Museum in, uh, in England, which is currently at, at, at the site of his old house. His observational history as a professional astronomer, uh, which at the time wasn't, he wasn't a professional astronomer yet, uh, was focusing on binary stars. Using uh, his own uh, six-inch Newtonian telescope, uh, he began observing career like many of us do from the back of his house in England. Uh, being the mid 1700s at this point, there's really no light pollution in England, so we, he, you know, don't have to worry much about that there. Uh, he presented his findings uh, on many of the, of the star systems that he observed to the Royal Astronomical Society between 1780 and 1783. Uh, I cannot, uh, most of his observations, uh, excuse me, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Uh, so he would continue to publish double star observations for better part of a decade, well in the time when he had actually begun working on assembling the general catalog, uh, which would eventually become the NGC catalog, which we talked about last month. He was the first uh, person to propose and then confirm that some binary systems are uh, what we now uh, now that know as orbiting binary stars. They weren't optical binaries where they're just two stars that are on the optical binaries or two stars that are on the same line of sight but don't orbit each other. So he was the first one to connect that some of these star systems are actually true multiple star systems. They aren't solo star like our sun. Uh, and his works here on double stars actually set the basis, a lot of the foundation work that led into, that is used in modern day binary star astronomy. So he, one of several fields that he uh, helped spark and helped build out, which we now is a very active area of research today. His next major uh, achievement was the discovery of the planet Uranus. Uh, during an observational run in 1781, William was observing, uh, I think it was in the constellation Hydra, I have, uh, a fuzzy disk as part of his observational campaigns where he was documenting some, uh, he first uh, believed the fuzzy spot to be a comet. Uh, and if anyone who has seen a Uran Uranus through one of their own telescopes uh, would is kind of is an interesting uh, take, uh, but considering the optics at the time, it kind of it does make sense. We use a small pale blue dot for Uranus, and he wanted to resolve more details about it, uh, trying to see the, what type of comet it uh, was and looking through various things. He reported the findings uh, to English astronomer Neville Maskelyne and Russian astronomer. Uh, Russian mathematician, excuse me, Anders, uh, Anders Johann Lexel. Uh, Neville, well, his fame to credit, his um, claim to fame as being the first person to actually 
to empirically uh, measure the mass of the Earth. Uh, interesting topic on him if you want to go learn more about that. Lexel and William, uh, they set out collaborating and trying to compute the orbit of this comet that Herschel had found and eventually settled on an agreement that it was uh, likely a planetary object that was beyond the, and it was certainly beyond the orbit of Saturn. Uh, so having this potential new planet in hand uh, and setting out to try to help establish himself uh, a wealthy patron, he named his new planet uh, Gregorium Sidus after King George III, which proved to be a pretty smart play on his part. Uh, uh, but bitter relations between France and England uh, meant that they actually didn't call the planet Gregorium Sidus in France, uh, and they actually just called it uh, the planet Herschel. <laughs> after the creditors, after uh, the discoverer's name. Uh, his discovery of the planet earned him English knighthood and a position as a court astronomer, uh, which eventually earned him a pardon for his desertion, as we talked about earlier, and also set him up to be with a steady paying job, which he used to uh, formally abandon his musical career and allowed him to pursue astronomy full time. Uh, he would later discover the two moons of Uranus, Titania and Oberon, uh, in 1787. Uh, at some point uh, between his discovery of Uranus and his double stars campaign, someone had sent him a copy of Messier's famous catalog, uh, piquing his interest in deep sky objects. And from 1782 to 1802, using at least four different tele he used at least four different telescopes in his observational e efforts to catalog various deep sky objects, uh, which formed the foundation of what we now know as the general catalog and the NGC catalog. Uh, using uh, two telescopes with two telescopes that each had a 20 foot focal length, uh, one telescope with a seven foot focal length which is the telescope that he himself built, one of the first telescopes that, excuse me, one of the first telescopes that he built himself. And it was actually one of his personal favorite telescopes. And a, the, a, the large monster, which uh, known as the Great 40 Telescope, which uh, remained the largest telescope in the world for about 50 years during this time period. So this is a, a rough drawing and sketch of the Great 40 Telescope. It was uh, paid for by money from the English Crown. It cost about, in, in $1,700, about 300 British pounds for all the iron, uh, which is quite a bit of money. But the whole telescope is assembled out of iron. Uh, and I have a picture of the primary mirror, which still exists uh, and is housed in a museum at this point. Uh, and interesting, even though the British Crown paid for the telescope and continued to pay money to, for the telescope's maintenance, it was owned outright by, by, by the Herschels. Uh, kind of one of those weird things you don't, you wouldn't necessarily uh, link together in, uh, you know, usually when the royal family pays for something, they own it. So it was an interesting split in ownership. Uh, this is the primary mirror of the Great 40 Telescope. You see that it's, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure from this picture if the, if the lack of shine is just from the construction techniques of the day, or if it's just showing off how much the metal has uh, cor not corroded, um, has aged, um, and that we're, we're seeing, uh, I forget the, the term for it, any, what anyone remember what the term it is for like when you have the anodization or whatever it is like on silver? It oxidizes. Oxidizing. Thank you. I don't know why. Yeah. Or if that's just the, or if the lack of shine here on, on the mirror is just because the metal itself is oxidated and aged over time. Uh, so this mirror might uh, at one point have been much more reflective than this picture currently indicates. But it, this mirror is. I think I said 48 inches. So this is about a one meter, a one meter mirror by today's standards. 
Uh, all throughout this time, through his cataloging of deep sky objects, his discovery of Uranus, uh, he would be working with his younger sister, Carolyn, who moved to England in 1772 uh, and you know, proceeded to be in, uh, indoctrinated into astronomy by her brother. She became his official assistant uh, when he was recruited as a court astronomer for the British Royal Court and uh, would eventually become a qualified astronomer in her own right, making uh, a lot more discoveries, which hopefully we'll learn more about here uh, over some other presentations. Uh, but two notable items is that she was the first paid female, female professional astronomer and the first female in England to be given a government position. Uh, Uh, Doug, were you trying to speak? Uh, I heard some some background noise over a mic. I'm not quite sure who it was. Did anyone was anyone chiming in there? No. Okay. Uh, kind of talking through their their working relationship. Um, one of the twenty when one of the twenty foot telescopes. Um, came into service, uh, he, William was attempting to observe and record all of his observations, which involved this lengthy process of going to the telescope, um, looking at the sky, running inside, letting his eyes adjust to the candlelight that he was using to write down uh, his observations, writing them down, running outside, waiting for eyes to get dark adapted again, and then repeating the process. Uh, uh, but once uh, Caroline settled more into her role, he eventually just started shouting his observations to her as she sat in, next to a window upstairs in their house and started and acting as uh, his official scribe, while also relaying uh, any reference and references or other details that he needed, uh, such as objects that might be in an area of the sky that he's currently looking at through uh, their, the a library that the, they kept in the house. Uh, his next major discovery was, uh, excuse me, was the discovery of infrared light. Uh, he originally, uh, being a builder of his own telescopes, he wanted to find a color of glass that would work as a filter to enable him to view the sun. In the late 1790s, he noted that depending on what material he used, uh, some would allow more light through, but a, a lot of light through very little heat, uh, and others would enable the opposite, allowing very little light through, but a lot of heat. Uh, through a series of experiments, this led him down a line of reasoning that uh, one color was best for viewing and another color was best uh, used for heating. Uh, uh, potentially as for cooking, uh, cooking food or things like that. Uh, I would strongly advise, do not try to repeat these experiments today on your own. You will likely do and damage your eyes uh, because the sun is very bright and can be a dangerous target to look at unless you have proper equipment. So please don't do that. Uh, so moving down his chain of experiments as he was setting out to investigate this light that these colors that produce heat, he built uh, what eventually became a precursor to modern spectrometers uh, called a spectral radiometer. And uh, there's a diagram of this here in a second. Uh, it, I wasn't able to find definitively if he was the original inventor uh, of the spectral radiometer or if he uh, borrowed the idea from someone else, uh, couldn't, uh, I, there was some evidence that Newton had something similar, uh, so it's not quite clear if he was the actual inventor of the spectrometer. So in this case, he, he used one, but I don't know if he was the actual inventor of the item. So in a spectral radiometer, uh, it's really a quite a simple Oh, it can't thing. be the same one. Sorry. So uh, in a spectral radiometer, it's divided into a, a prism, uh, a glass sliding window, 
to so that that they can use to observe specific colors. Uh, today, this would be a slit that would be used inside of uh, modern spectrometers to separate out specific frequencies of light, such as infrared, uh, that would get cast onto uh, our modern modern sensors. And two and three thermometers. There's only two shown here, but he actually used three. Well, one thermometer was used to to uh, record the temperatures of the light channel that he was looking at in his experiments in, in this particular image, recording the cult, the temperature of yellow light. The other two were used to serve as uh, control temperatures, uh, control thermometers to record the background temperature of the ambient room. So just really simple, a prism, a sheet of paper, three thermometers. Uh, using this, he was able to determine that the temperature and that depending on what color he was looking, uh, some of those that uh, the temperature and the brightness change with whatever with specific colors and observed that uh, yellow colors or pale green colors were the visual brightest, uh, which uh, we, we didn't determine until much later that this is because this is the primary frequency of colors emitted by the, sorry, not the primary frequency colors, the brightest colors that are emitted by the sun. Uh, and also ones that our eyes have biologically evolved to be more sensitive to. Uh, he saw in the, uh, as he was working down to record the various temperature readings of the colors over many months, uh, he noticed that there is this interesting line on his beta as he was graphing it uh, that although red had the highest temperature, there was no plateau uh, like you would expect with a curve to go up, like, like a wave curve, which would go up, it would peak and then start going down. Uh, and it actually, his data just kept, would just kept going beyond where red was. Uh, writing at the time, uh, I likewise conclude that the full red falls short of the maximum heat. Uh, which perhaps lies even beyond a little bit of visual refraction. Uh, here, he's basically saying that uh, what well, uh, we conclude is that you know, hey, hey uh, there's the heat keeps going up even at beyond the areas of red that I can see with my eyes. Uh, and concluded. Uh, and concluded that there were some types of light that emitted by the sun, uh, which were unfit for vision, essentially saying, hey, there's this unseen type of light uh, that we just don't observe, kind of, uh, which was uh, interesting for a lot of reasons, uh, which I, I will fail to explain uh, in, the, in this just because it there's a huge article and I will point out the reference if you want to go read more about some of the conclusions and how it was reached. Uh, so over the course of 200 different experiments, I apologize for the typo there, uh, he eventually concluded that heat and light both came from the same source. Uh, well, the same phenomenon, excuse me. Uh, some of his other uh, key discoveries is uh, he was the f oh. he was the first to propose a model of the Milky Way galaxy through observational data, correctly assuming that it was in the shape of a disk, but he got a lot of other details wrong. Uh, for one, he assumed that the sun was at the center of this disk uh, and not uh, something else, uh, which uh, he, uh, as kind of mentioned a couple of times, he assembled the general catalog, which would later become the NGC catalog, uh, which uh, was published by his son, uh, John Herschel. He discovered two Saturnian moons, Mimas and Enceladus, and he was one of two astronomers that uh, observed that uh, the Martian ice caps uh, grow, grew and shrank depending on the season on Mars. He was also the first to determine uh, what direction our solar system is moving in the galaxy. Uh, currently, we are moving in the direction uh, of, a, of a region of space in the constellation Hercule, uh, Hercules. 
and he was only off by about 10 degrees in that original uh and of what we now know today is the true direction so uh considering error bars at the time that's actually a re phenomenally precise estimate uh and he also helped found the royal the astronomical society of london which would later become the royal astronomical society uh which has uh, those two groups playing a very large role in some of the discoveries for modern astronomy over the last 200 years. Uh, this is a, a rough picture of Herschel's model of the Milky Way. Uh, kind of, you can see here on the sides, you have the spiral, the spiral shape on this plane here. Let me see if I can, where's the pointer? Here we go. Uh, but I, but other than that, there's not a lot of details that we would recognize today from, you know, what we've seen from both visually and of what the Milky Way looks like. But still, this is a phenomenal effort to just catalog and position all of these stars. Um, questions or comments? I'll have references up here in a second uh, after this slide. I always thought Herschel was in, was older than eight seventeen eighties or something like that. I thought he was like in the sixteen hundreds or whatever, or fifteen hundreds. But okay, mm -hmm. surprise. Uh, uh, one of he certainly was uh, one of the astronomers that came after Messier, uh, since many of his objects in the NUC catalog incorporated objects from Messier. So kind of, but yes, it. Okay. Yeah, I think it's so amazing that he was a musician. All that music that he did, uh, and that that you know, he's just he's such a totally um, well-rounded person. Person of note. Uh, so, if you actually want to learn a little bit more about, uh, if you like reading about uh, some scientific scientific history, this uh, link here. Uh, at the bottom uh, has a really good, as a really good story and really, really, really basic, really informative on describing, you know, the process about how Herschel um, discovered and, you know, defended himself uh, in his discovery for infrared light. Uh, he was actually, um, it was actually a very controversial discovery. Uh, some of the people who uh, were experts in light and heat actually were attacking him because they thought that an astronomer didn't have a place in the field and that he didn't know what he was talking about. So it was actually a little bit more uh, of a rough and tumble adventure in his, in, you know, the, like as he that. published his work on uh, infrared light. It's also really interesting to see how he reached from one conclusion to another to, to just say, no, this, this thing is real. So this is actually a very interesting read, and I highly recommend it. Uh, so with that, that's all I got. Uh, thank you, everyone. If there's no more questions. And I'll end the Thank you, Connor.